Hi, everyone, and welcome. I can see our attendees are filling in. Takes a few seconds for that to happen. Um, so while that happens, let's just confirm if you are here for a conversation with author Caribbean Fergosa, um, you are absolutely in the right place. And it's your lucky day because her laptop is working <laughs> as of about 30 seconds ago. So, um, so welcome, welcome. As you fill in, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a little uh, bookkeeping out of the way. Thank you for joining us at Alta Live, our digital event series. Here we do it, um, Alta Journal. I'm Beth Spotswood, Alta's digital editor, and I am very excited to welcome author of Eat the Mouth That Feeds You, Caribbean Fergosa. Caribbean will read some of her work for us today. Um, and then she'll be in conversation with Ziz's, Ziziva's Oscar Villalon. Um, Oscar is also an Alta contributor and one of our um, frequent guest moderators. So he's old hat at this and knows exactly what he's doing. Caribbean, you are in great hands. Um, they're gonna chat for about 25 minutes and then we're gonna get to your questions. So I encourage you to use the chat feature or the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom. Um, and any questions you've got for Caribbean, for Oscar, um, please pop them there. And at about 12.55 or so, Oscar's going to invite me back and we're gonna get to as many of your questions as possible. Um, really quickly, if you're unfamiliar with Alta, we are a quarterly journal focused on California and the West. Our new issue is out, um, our summer issue is out this week, but I really, I want to encourage you to, to visit us and I will link to this. Caribbean has this incredible story, Larry's Biggest Mistake. It's a, it's a short piece of fiction that is, if I may say so, extraordinary and just knocked my socks off. So um, if you've registered for this event, I've got your email address. I'm going to shoot you links to this story, how to buy Caribbean's book, how to read Oscar's work, um, and anything else they talk about, as well as a video of this event, which is being recorded. So again, please don't hesitate to ask questions. We're going to get to as many of them as possible. And with that, I'm going to get out of the way and um, turn it over to Oscar. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out uh, and seeing uh, this conversation between myself and Caribbean Fergosa about her her singular uh, story collection, um, Eat the Mouth uh, That Feeds You. Uh, before we get into, the, in, into our talk, though, I was, um, I'd was i ask Caribbean if she wouldn't mind reading a little bit uh, from one of the stories in the collection. And uh, after she does that, then we'll, uh, we'll jump into the conversation. Uh, Caribbean, how does that sound? Yeah, it sounds good. Can you hear me, Oscar? I can. Okay, so we're good with volume? Mm-hmm. Okay, just had to check. Um, so hi everybody, um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, we just averted a small crisis and that's a good thing. Whenever we can survive these little catastrophes, it's a fantastic, miraculous thing. So um, I'm gonna uh, not talk very much and just get right into it. So um, I'm gonna be reading from my new book, Eat the Mouth That Feeds You uh, with City Lights. Uh, who I love very, very much. And I'm gonna be reading an excerpt from a short story called Ini Ifati. And um, just to give you a few words about it, um, Ini uh, Ifati is a story about two girls. One of them is alive, one of them is not really. Uh, and they become friends. So Ini is a young virgin martyr or saint uh, that is worshiped by many people. Um, and she becomes friends with this mortal, this young girl named Fatima. Um, she actually saves her life when she's struck by lightning mysteriously. Um, so anyway, it's a strange tale about their friendship. Um, so I'll just jump in. Almost daily, Ini Ifati played in the vacant lot regularly inspecting and tending to a garden no one else saw or cared about. Their dolls went on magical adventures in a landscape suddenly transformed from one of neglect into one of possibility, which Ini endowed with her special touch. Watch this, said Ini, and the thorny bush under which their dolls rested from their vigorous play suddenly bloomed with great purple flowers. Fatima gasped 
and watched in awe as buds appeared on the barren branches, swelling open to unravel their fleshy petals, stretching their delicate necks toward patches of sunlight that broke through the dense clouds. Fatima pushed her face into a cluster of blossoms and breathed in, deeply inhaling their sweet scent. She led her doll on an exploration of the magical bush. Pleased, Ini's halo glowed. Another day, they discovered a dead sparrow strewn among the rubble. Its tiny chest had been gashed open, but it was otherwise intact, left to die alone under the unsympathetic sky. Fati crouched over the bird in perplexed silence. Though she'd seen many dead animals, most of them were at least half eaten by their predator when she found them. She'd never seen a creature killed like this, not for food, but for some other reason she had not accounted for in nature. It's a common mistake, said Ini, to think of animals as noble creatures. I remember my mother saying it all the time that dogs were better than humans because they protected their young. And that was more than she could say for many people. But I can tell you, animals are no better or worse than, than humans. And we are no better than they. They also take pleasure in killing. Fati protested, I don't kill things for fun. Most people don't. But we all sometimes do mean things for fun. There doesn't always have to be a reason. And we don't always have to care about being good or fair, like crushing ants or spiders or ripping petals off beautiful flowers. Sometimes it's just because. Ini noticed Fatima holding her doll more tightly against her chest as if, as if to protect herself and the doll from the sparrow's fate. You're right. Most just do their best. We just wanna feel protected and to protect people we love, right? There's nothing wrong with that, right? Thank you, Caribbean. Um, I wanna to talk to you a little bit more about that story, but, but before we do, I wanna guess give some context around the collection uh, for, our, for our audience. I think the first thing that's important to know is the fact that the book is published by City Lights. And I think that tells you a lot. Um, much like everything else that City Lights publishes, this, the stories here have a life to them. I don't know how else to quite describe it, but they, they, they seem to have, they thrum with the sort of fire um, that, that's absolutely compelling. Uh, these are so unique. I mean, reading your collection, I kept thinking, how would I describe these stories? Because to me, again, they're rather singular, they're, yes, there are elements of the Gothic. There's horror, body horror. There's elements that what you'd call of, of, of menace, but there's also so much tenderness and there's love in these stories. Um, even when dealing in some of the stories definitely deal with what we could call grotesque scenarios, they never repulse, uh, but rather they, they draw the reader in. Having said that, these are also stories about women uh, Mexican and Mexican American women and how they must navigate incredibly fraught territories and how they draw strength and exhibit strength. I'm thinking of the stories such as Tortillas Burning and Lumberjack Mom and the title story. Uh, I think they make us see our mothers and our grandmothers in a way that speaks to their tenacity, their generosity. And then stories such as Ini Fati, Mysterious Bodies in Crystal Palace, I think those speak to what younger women and girls must still contend with, but done in the surreal narrative sometimes uh, and through powerful metaphors. So let me ask you, uh, how do you see your stories? How would you describe them? Um, there's many ways to describe them, but immediately I think of, of that. I always think of my stories and when I'm writing them and living in, in that world of my stories as um, like just a, a reality that's just like one or two degrees off, not quite where we're at, but just gives us like, 
just some space for 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 the strange to happen and the strange is always actually not that strange because it really is stuff that can happen and that does happen in the dimension that we're in right now so when we talk about like magical things happening or like i don't know grotesque things happening they're just actually part of the world that we all live in now right so like people talk about the body as being grotesque and uh it's it's it can be perceived in that way but it's also just a body you know when we really talk about like giving birth or menstruation or or just any other function of the body like we can see it as a grotesque thing but then it's also just like part of life that we deal on a daily basis and for some cultures I know in Latin America, like the magical and like the surreal is not like this, ooh, like Halloween-y thing that happens uh, out there or like in very special occasions. It's like there's miracles and horrific things that happen that can't always been explained and they happen all the time. Like that's just something that we live with. And being the child of immigrants, like, I feel like that's part of just like the way I see the world. Yeah, you, you, I, that's, that, that's so interesting because I, I think that is absolutely reflecting these stories. Um, one of the, these things, these, I think all these stories deal with is that uh, death is with us always. It hovers next to us. That in fact, death is not the antithesis of life, but it is part of life. And indeed, hearing you now uh, talk about this, Yes, that you know, decay is something that happens. Um, these these are not affronts, but rather it's actually part of of, of a natural cycle. You, you begin young, you grow old if you're lucky, and things happen to you. You know that these things are not we're not separated from that. And I think your story does that in such a way that's so story elegant. Um, you know, one of the things that always makes me flinch a little is whenever uh, someone. Uh, tries to do quote unquote magical realism, um, you know, which is to say when you try to exoticize something. And I think uh, your stories are a reminder that that's totally, if you're exoticizing it through magical realism, then you probably don't get what it is you're writing about. That in fact, it is all too common or it should feel common because it's, it's, not, it's not something that is apart from you. It's not something that's othered. In Eni and Fati, um, Again, I think, you know, this is a story basically about a lonely girl who, you know, in, in difficult situation within her own, her own household, right? But you find a way to, for us to see the story anew by bringing in um, a child saint, which I wanted to ask you a little bit about. Now, how did, how did you come up with the idea of telling the story through a child saint, which in itself is such an interesting concept because many of these children were very unhappy. There's a reason why they, they're dead at such a young age. Yeah. Um, so the story, uh, without telling a very long story about it, um, I went to, I think I was in Guanajuato. I was just kind of like backpacking around and I, uh, my, fa my family's from Guadalajara. So these are these very Catholic towns and cities in Mexico. And we see virgins and saints everywhere. And I saw, I forget which little virgin, essentially a child. And there's all these like stories and mythologies about the child saint that gets up in the middle of the night and goes for a walk. And uh, when you wake up in the morning, she's back in her altar, but her shoes are muddy because she was traveling around the town. So these are stories my grandmother would tell me. Uh, but once I drew this little virgin saint and I was just so charmed with her and I actually started developing a, like a comic book series. It was called The Virgin Vengeance. And it was just about <laughs> like just vengeance by this little virgin, like inflicted mostly on dudes, like for being jerks in the world. <laughs> and it was just like, boom, that's what you get. Lightning on your head, like just do, <laughs> doing these like crazy things. And then uh, I set that aside and let it, it for a long time and then I eventually developed it into the story and I just wanted to tell a more uh, intimate story through the experience of Fatima this one particular little girl and the tragedies in her life living in 
an abusive household where the father abuses everybody, especially the mother and the child martyr really uh, seen herself in this living child because she was essentially murdered by her own father centuries ago. Uh, and there's also this child saint or martyr in Guadalajara. And you could actually still see her if you go to the cathedral, her body is laid in a glass case and you can go see her scary skin. And sometimes she oozes stuff from her nose. And I do relish in the grotesque. I'm not going to pretend like it's just <laughs> the same thing. Kind of a lot of fun with that too. The, um, uh, there's, there's, it's to, it's to give our readers a sense of, of, of the story collection, but there are also stories in here which we may call, let's say, more straight ahead realist. And uh, for example, Vicious Ladies, which I, which I found so fascinating, um, not only because it was a world I wasn't really quite aware of, which was the sort of like these, you know, um, party crews uh, where, you know, kids basically pay to get nitrous or get beer, or really bad beer usually. And, you know, but it's also one of the very few stories I've read that captures so well the anxieties of, of let's say, lower middle class Mexican Americans who quote unquote make it. Um, you know, we, we make it out of your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, not just in terms, you know, it raises so many questions about identity, about how such people see themselves but also in terms of what do they owe their neighborhood? What do they owe their peers? I was wondering if you could talk about that a little. Yeah, you definitely, I'm glad you picked up on that anxiety. Um, yeah, I think that's something that many of us experience where we come from a neighborhood and we identify strongly with it. At the same time, we um, want to, break away from it and be our own people and have some sort of experience of upward mobility. I mean, that's one of the reasons why our parents came to this country so we could do better or uh, live a better life. And it's expected that it's supposed to move in that upward direction or progress at, from one generation to the next. I think that's part of the American dream, but it doesn't work that way. I just think that's such a mythology that we've all bought into and it's hard to break out of. I mean, we all want a better life for ourselves and our future generations, but how do you do that when so many things are stacked up against us? And in particular for communities of color, um, I'm from El Monte, South El Monte in the San Gabriel Valley. And there's a lot of working class communities like that where we're taught that education is the way, like mm -hmm. that is the key. And if you go get a college degree, like there's no way to fail. Like you're going to make it, you've got the key. Yeah. But then once you've got the key, you're like, well, where does this key fit? Like, where am I supposed to go with this? And what doors are the ones that are for me? And upward mobility is, is just not real. It's just not real for a lot of people, even college educated people. And so I think I really wanted to I don't know, just kind of crunch through a lot of those, as you say, anxieties in that story. So my character ends up selling Nas and like getting young kids high in a party crew, something she never wanted to do. You're not supposed to go to college to come back home and be like a gang member or mm -hmm. something like that. But shoot, like what else are you supposed to do sometimes? I don't know. Well, yeah, it, it, I mean, it does raise this question of like, what is authenticity? What does it mean? It's like the varieties of being Mexican American. What, what, how is one Mexican American? What does that look like? But it's also true that you know you feel in that sort of situation, which vicious ladies is so well, of knowing that the rest of the neighborhood also sees you for what you may be. In other words, they know if you're acting superior. They know if you're acting well, if you're putting on airs. But also with that, a sort of sad wisdom of sort of looking in this particular case at the character, at the protagonist and saying, I mean, what do you really think is going to happen? Like, who do you really think you are? Yeah. Um, which brings me to your, your the penultimate, excuse me, the, the last story in the collection, um, Me Muero. Uh, I was reading the interview you did with the Orange County Register. And in it, you said about this 
wonderful story in which um, the protagonist is literally, she's, she's dead. She's on the clean concrete mm -hmm. of, of, of the family's backyard in, such a, in a great line in there, we describe how thankfully it's been swept, it's free of dirt and it's, there are no insects. It's actually quite comfortable being on this concrete and leaves her body and starts milling about the house and some of her relatives can see her and some can't. But you said about that story that I know it's about dying, but it's really about figuring out my way through life without guidance, which is something I think we just we touched upon talking about vicious ladies. Could you, you expand upon that just a little bit more? Because I think it speaks to, okay, yes, let's say, like as you were saying, you do get out of college and then what? Right. Yeah, and then what? I think, <clears throat> I think death is kind of like that. Like we all know what's gonna happen and it's there and it's real, but then like, then what? What happens after you die and what happens to your body and who can guide you through that? And in some ways, um, and there's like something else beyond there, another way to exist. But for myself and I think for other college educated first generation Mexican Americans or children of immigrants, it's like, okay, you go to college because you know for certain that that's supposed to help you get somewhere, but then what? what is that? And how do you navigate your way? And who can see you? Who can guide you? Who knows what your needs are? Uh, some Maybe it's your family, but most likely not. Maybe it's mentors and friends you find along the way. Uh, so there's a lot of just trying to grapple and struggle with that. And, and it, my character, as you say, like just kind of mills around the house and, and tries to really understand her place in the family and her, sort of her place in the world as she's getting ready to move into a new world, a new place that she doesn't know what's going to happen really. Um, and like death for me, I think for everybody is like the ultimate question, like what's going to happen when you die? And I don't know, this is just a strange moment right now we're living in where everybody's kind of thinking about death in their own way. Absolutely. Well, yeah, if you look at just the COVID numbers among communities of color, you know, you know, we've been this past year has been certainly one where you've, you know, you felt the scepter of the Grim Reaper, yeah. you know, on the backs of your, you know, on the backs of your necks, you know, of all, all these people's necks. Um, I, I think I'll bring on Beth really quickly here. Beth, are you there? I hope so. Hi. Hi. Um, a few questions for you, Caribbean, if we've still got a little bit of time. The first is, um, in addition to this book, which is getting extraordinary, extraordinary reviews, congratulations, including one, um, Wendy C. Ortiz reviewed you for Alta, and, um, is a righteous fan. Um, can you can you tell us a little bit about the other projects of which there are many you are currently working on? Yeah, there are many, too many. Um, so I'm also the editor of Boom California, which is a journal of UC Press. Um, so I co-edit that with my husband, Romeo Guzman. So uh, we've been doing that for about a little over a year. So that's one thing that's always in the works. I also recently launched Vicious Ladies, which is an online zine of cultural criticism by women and sort of gender non-conforming uh, cultural critics of color. Uh, so that's pretty brand new. Um, I'm also working on a couple of book projects. Um, and uh, what else am I doing? I'm also right now at the Kate and Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award office. I'm the coordinator of the Kate and Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. So that's something that I do. Um, and uh, I'm a mom. I have two little ones, a two-year-old and a nine-year-old. So I'm busy <laughs> a lot. Um, uh, I, I have a two-year-old as well. I feel you. Um, Elaine asks, how is it going having all of the opinions expressed about your work? So many glowing reviews, endorsements, enthusiasm. It's impressive and a dream debut. How are you doing with navigating all of this attention being paid to your stories? Is it an author's dream? Um, uh, is it jarring? Um, is it generative? Yeah, it is a dream. It is a dream. And I, I can't believe it. it. Any given day, I just wake up and I'm like, I can't believe 
that this is happening in like the New York Times and the LA Times profile that just came out. So it's been really interesting because it's the first time that I really feel seen um, and that that people, so many people are giving us uh, so much attention and pain or giving such a close eye to the work. And that is like a unique experience for me because I usually just kind of go about my lonely day writing. And I'm also a journalist. So I like just try to meet my deadline, punch in the article, file it, and I'm done. And I move on to the next thing and I don't really think about it. So here I get to sort of linger and think about what other people are saying. And I have to say, it's been like a really awesome learning experience. I mean, every person that has written or talked about my work brings in their own sort of bodies of knowledge about literature. And uh, they bring in things that I hadn't thought of or am not familiar with. And it, I feel like it's just sort of expanding my view of my own work and maybe things I wanna try in the future. So it's been, I don't know, I guess I just try to turn like a studious eye to all of the feedback that I'm getting. That's just kind of how I am. So it's been thrilling and really like just such a great learning experience for me. I know um, Dana asks a question here and I think it's, it's related to something that you mentioned in the LA Times profile, which yes, Lisa, we will link to all of these things. I'm writing them down. Um, you you said you initially wanted your first book to be a novel um, and instead it's a collection of short stories. What did you want to do with this collection that might be different than what you could do with a novel? I think this collection or collections in general, I think for this collection, it allowed me to sort of take different, a lot of different angles on the ideas that I was thinking about uh, having to do with, with women, uh, Mexican-American women, immigrant women, the children of immigrants, um, all the different themes that I deal with in this book. Um, but I, I, there's a lot of freedom in being able to jump from one angle to another angle to another angle. Uh, there's like space to do that. Whereas in a novel, it's been my experience so far as I've worked on my current novel, it, it feels like it has to be a lot more focused and contained and everything has to sort of fit together. Whereas in the collection, there's just more room to move around and a lot more flexibility to take on these different perspectives. Nassim asks, um, she's interested in the colors of the last story. Typically we think of death as gray and sort of decaying, but the character here oozes out body parts in a variety of colors and sort of literally explodes with life. Where did those colors in death come from for you? Yeah, um, I think being Catholic or having been raised Catholic like informs so much. I mean, there's just death in all aspects of Catholic culture. And if you just travel to most Catholic churches, especially in Latin America, like they're full of color and vibrant, vibrant colors everywhere and, and gems and gold stolen from places they should not have stolen these things from and, and velvets and just like all these beautiful colors and textures. So I have always associated like just death with all this like plush uh, texture and color and vibrancy. And I also think of, I don't know, I think of those body parts and those fluids coming out of my character as just being, I don't know, just things that are going to be generative to some bacteria or thing in the, I mean, it's going to be life. It's going to feed back into whatever the earth needs. And it's just part of that whole cycle of life. It, it's not an end. It's just like something that's going to continue and regenerate. All right. Well, speaking of that regenerative life, I think we can end with this question that's for both of you. Oscar, it has come to my attention here in the chat that you have a, a ghost story from your mother. Mm-hmm. That can is you please share that and can we get Caribbean's reaction to it, please? Oh, it's, 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 a, it's a long story, basically, but, but 
uh, the, let me boil it down as best as I can. Uh, my late mother, um, who uh, was raised in La Puente. I went, yes, yes. I was a, when I was a little kid, I lived in La Puente. I went to, uh, I think it was, uh, was a Via Corda Elementary. Um, she, uh, one night she was asleep in her uh, bedroom that she shared with my, with my uh, aunt, Terry. And um, she heard a knocking on the door and uh, it was her aunt, her aunt who lived with them. And uh, she basically, she opened the door and she poked her head in and she asked my mom uh, if uh, she, what she wanted for breakfast. Did she want to get up and she was getting ready because she used to make them, I guess probably because she felt like she was imposing, she made breakfast for everybody every day because she was staying with them. And you know, then she closed the door. And normally that wouldn't be such a big deal except that at that time, my uh, mom's aunt was actually in Yucatan. So she, yeah, so she froze in terror. And then a few minutes later, uh, my aunt's voice comes out from the dark and says, Marilu, did you see that? And they both started bawling. They both started crying, which got my grandfather, of course, running into the room because why are his two teen daughters, you know, bawling in the middle of the night. And then they told them, you know, what they saw, that they saw their aunt. And, you know, my grandfather, I don't know what he made of that. But later that morning, uh, they got a phone call from uh, my aunt's nephew saying, uh, you know, my, aunt, uh, my mom's dead. So, and she died very, it was a very horrible accident. It was a terrible car accident down Yucatan. And so, um, Essentially, you know, this is a story that my mother told me. And uh, one of the things that was, I think, the most frightening aspect of that story was not even seeing her dead aunt, but my mom had just got her driver's license. And the first thing she had to do after getting her driver's license is drive my grandfather from La Puente to LAX, uh -oh. which in of itself is just terrifying. Um, you know, if you've never really, if you haven't driven much at all, and I mean, granted, this was, you know, LA traffic wasn't as bad back then. This is the late 60s, but still, that's a schlep. And if you just got your driver's license, my God, can you imagine navigating around there? And then try, I mean, there's no iPhone to get you home. Uh, there's, you know, you just got to rely on the Thomas brothers and hope to God you get on the right freeways to get back. So that was, yeah, so that, 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 was, that was the story. Wow. Yeah, I see people saying that they got goosebumps and the yeah, I know. pelitos. I get little tears in the corners of my eyes squeezing out. I think the impulse usually when you hear like a ghost story is to think is to like reciprocate with another story like, oh, yes, yeah, something like that happened to because I've heard these like stories before. And so I don't know, like my impulse is to my reaction is to like, tell my own stories and things that I've heard also. So that's sort of my reaction. I think that's one of the beauties of like, like the horror genre or like just ghost stories in general. Like they're very like uh, oracular. I don't know. There's just like this tendency to, to share orally and then to like almost in a call and response, like to share back something well, else. Well, Caribbean, I, I would direct this back to your work because, you know, I, my mother told me that story when I was like six. And, you know, just like recounting the weather. It wasn't a big deal. It's just like, oh, this is what happened. You know, so in other words, it wasn't told in, to horrify. It was yeah. just told as like, this is, you know, people see ghosts, the dead aren't gone. You know, they stick around, you yeah. know? And there was a whole other thing. I, there was an exorcism later too. That's a whole other thing too. Cause she, yeah, she wouldn't leave. Um, she wouldn't oh my, leave. We're gonna do a whole yeah. separate anyway, live just but, on. Yeah, that's Oscar's family's exorcisms. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, Caribbean, this is what you do so well in your stories, that this is, it's, it, it ain't no thing. That yeah. these stories are, are common. It's no big, like, if I, you know, if I told this, you know, my, with my cousins in Mexico, like, oh, yeah, whatever, so-and-so did this, and so-and-so did that, that, you know, it's like, whatever. It's, it's interesting, it's fun to talk about, but we never stayed up at night, you know, like, terrified or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we used to have a ghost at my grandmother's house. I think it's still there, but my tia used to say, oh, whenever you see him, just, you know, just say hi or whatever. <laughs> just let him keep going. And that's what we're supposed to do. Just let him be. Just move on with your day. Could you okay. imagine how much different the movie Poltergeist would have been if it had been a Mexican-American family? 
Be like, ah. <laughs> like just go, the ghost needs the TV right now. Just do something else. Go outside and play. We just don't don't use the TV. It's the ghost is doing its thing. Um, well, with that, on that, I've got a lot to think about here. I, again, we're gonna, Oscar, you and me at least are gonna get back to that exorcism. Um, mm. I, I just wanna thank you all. First, before you guys go, I wanna let um, everyone who's here know, I'm gonna send you, again, all of those links. People are asking, make sure I will send the links to all of this, um, and I indeed shall. Um, so stay tuned for that later this afternoon. Um, I also wanna let you know, next week we've got two exciting events. The first is uh, Alta Live back here Wednesday, the 14th at 1230. We're gonna talk to Dezo Molnar, who is um, on a mission to create the first street legal flying car. He's a, it's Adam Fisher, a journalist, um, and Dezo will join us next week to discuss their, this huge feature story in the current issue that is really exciting. And they're in the Mojave Desert on New Year's Day, having this insane adventure in it, attempting to fly a car. Um, the next day on April 15th at 5 p.m., California Book Club is so excited to welcome Miriam Gerba. She's going to discuss her new memoir, Mean, um, and she'll be in conversation with Gustavo Ariano. Um, and so both of those events are free. Everyone is more than welcome. We are so excited um, about all of these events we're doing. So, and we're, and we're most grateful to everyone who comes to them. And of course, Oscar and Caribbean. What a joy to have both of your work in Alta and get to get to work a little bit with you both. It's just an absolute pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank, you, thank you everyone for coming. Stay safe, get vaccinated, and we will see you soon.